Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode eight of Gone But Never Forgotten. We hope that this episode finds you and yours well. As our avid listeners know, most of our stories cover Canadian content, and today's is no different. What is interesting about today's story is it potentially ties together many stories from two different provinces. A story that has potentially left an untold number of families without answers as to exactly what happened to their daughters and who killed their precious children. Before we begin, I want to welcome back my lovely co-host and wife, Julie, to the program. Welcome back, Julie. We definitely missed you last week. Hi, everyone. It's definitely good to be back. Um, I'm back to 100%, so I'm excited to get this started. Um, So here we go. As we often do, we must warn our listeners from the outset that today's episode contains content that may not be acceptable for all listeners. We will be talking in detail about themes such as murder and sexual assault, and we are aware that those topics can be traumatic for listeners. Listener discretion is advised. For this week's episode, we're going to start out in Quebec. As mentioned, our horrible story that affected many lives starts out in a different province than the one in the title. Our story starts out in Compton, Quebec, where a young 19-year-old student, Teresa Allure, went missing on Friday, November 3rd, 1978, from Champlain College, Lennoxville. Teresa had turned down invitations from friends to get together that night, telling them that she was going to head home to study. She lived about 8 kilometers from campus, but if students missed that last bus, many of them would simply hitchhike home. It would be five months later, April 13th, 1979, after the winter thaw, that the body of Teresa would heartbreakingly be discovered by a trapper in about eight feet of water in the Coticook River near Compton, Quebec. Making matters worse, her remains were not in good shape. We will start off early with the usual complaints that many of us true crime lovers have from cases from this time. The police seemed to just write off the case from the very beginning, as their preliminary response was to say that Teresa's death was probably caused by a drug overdose. This, after they decided upon her original disappearance, that she was probably just another runaway. In 2016, however, the police finally reopened the case, first on the list of Quebec cold cases. Her brother John was at the forefront of that movement happening on her case after all these years and he has done a lot of work to try and get and keep Teresa's case in the eye of the police, the public, and the media. John has a website dedicated to his sister that can be found at TeresaAllure.com and also has a podcast dedicated to her memory as well entitled Who Killed Teresa? John has been incredibly vocal about the many ways that the police have botched his sister's story, and he also has suspicions that his sister may have been the victim of a serial killer. John has stated that he is of course elated that the case has been reopened, but he also realizes that the case is very old and very cold. Odds are that the perpetrator is now at least in his 60s, and anyone who may have seen what happened on that night has likely forgot or is long gone from the area of the crime. Making matters even worse, with advances in things like DNA, when the family got in contact with police to gather Teresa's belongings, they were only given her jewelry, leading the family to believe that all other material evidence, including clothing, has been since destroyed. One of the things that I found incredibly interesting and saddening as I was researching Teresa's case is that aside from John's work on the case, there is not a lot of information to be found. That includes by the police themselves, who to this day still respond to requests for information by saying that the case is still an open investigation and they will not comment at all on the fact that evidence from this case has completely disappeared. Further to that, Teresa's case is still looked at as a suspicious death and not as a homicide, 
even though the coroner's report states that marks on Teresa's body appeared to be marks from strangulation. Over the years, John teamed up with Patricia Pearson, who was an ex-girlfriend, a friend, and an avid crime writer, to investigate as much as they could into the case and into other possible connections. Interestingly, they did settle upon someone that they believed could be the killer of Teresa, and as they started to unpeel the onion, they also saw connections to Calgary and a plethora of unsolved cases that had taken place after Teresa's death. Much of this is chronicled in their book that was published in 2020 entitled Wish You Were Here, A Murdered Girl, A Brother's Quest, and The Hunt for a Serial Killer. The man that they felt there was connection to was Luke Gregoire. Luke was in prison for a 1993 brutal murder of a woman named Leilani Silva. Luke had abducted Silva from her job as a convenience clerk at a 7-Eleven in 1993. As John and Patricia worked together and started to dive into information available on Luke, they learned that he had been to jail for armed robbery in Edmonton and has worked as a roofer in Calgary, not to mention that he had an extensive criminal record in Quebec around the time of Teresa's death. They then realized that there was a lot of similarities between what he had done to Silva and other unserved murders that had occurred in Calgary during the years before Luke was sent to jail for the murder of Silva. This is where we will pivot across the country and head to Alberta to learn about a few of these other unsolved murders. Now, remember that the theory that Luke Gregoire could have been behind all of these murders is exactly that, a theory. But we do believe that there is a lot of compelling evidence to show that these murders and the murder, pardon me, the murder of Teresa Allor could very well have been connected. The first case that we are going to look at occurred on June 19th, 1991. A young lady who had recently moved to Calgary from British Columbia and who had recently started a new job as a stylist at Moda Hair Design, Shauna Vanderbash, spent an evening out with co-workers and friends. First, they attended a restaurant, and then they moved on to a benefit fashion show at the Tasmanian Ballroom, where she reportedly left at 1.30 a.m. Around 3.30 a.m., Shauna was dropped off by a friend at the corner of Southland Drive and McCloy Trail. <clears throat> Seven hours later, on the morning of June 20th, the naked body of Shauna Vanderbash was discovered next to a rural road not far from Highway 22X. There were reports that aside from her work at the salon, Shauna also worked as an escort, although there are differing opinions on that fact depending who you listen to. What could not be denied, however, was the fact that Shauna's body was found naked and it was determined that she was strangled to death. The RCMP would charge 42-year-old Isidrio Hernandez days later with the second-degree murder, but six months after that, the charges were dropped when fingerprinting cleared him of the murder. On August 13, 1991, the badly beaten body of 16-year-old Jennifer Jans was discovered in a shallow grave at a construction site along the Trans-Canada Highway just north of Calgary. Her cause of death was determined to have been a blunt, heavy blow to the chest. Jennifer had grown up in a good home. She was active in track and field, ballet, and gymnastics, and when she was younger, she excelled in school. In middle school, though, Jennifer would start to struggle. She failed grade 7 and would then proceed to drop out of school after grade 9. From there, she spent most of her life on the streets. However, she did keep in contact with her parents. By the summer of 1991, though, after spending time at a Christian camp, joining a youth group, and even finding a job and enrolling back in school, it appeared that Jennifer was nearing the decision to return home. In July, Jennifer would become very ill with a kidney infection. She was taken to the hospital by her father, visited by her family every day, and things seemed to be on the up and up. On July 12th, she called her mom and told her that she was checking out of the hospital and that she would return home for dinner the following week. The last time that Jennifer would be seen, sadly, was when she walked out of the emergency doors at the hospital. 
Not long after the discovery of Jennifer Jans' body, Calgary had another similar homicide on its hands in the form of 17-year-old Jennifer Joyes. Jennifer Joyce had become a ward of the province of Alberta in 1986 after her mom had passed away in 1986 in a car accident. She was well-adjusted and popular at school, and she had even moved into an independent living facility. On August 30th, 1991, however, Jennifer would be reported missing. Unfortunately, she too would be found buried in a shallow grave naked near 77th Street and 13th Street Southwest on October 6, 1991. Her body was only about two kilometers away from where Jennifer Jans' body was found. Her body was partially decomposed due to the time that likely lapsed between when her body was buried there and when her body was discovered. An October 11th, 1991 article in the Calgary Herald stated that Jennifer Joyce had been kicked off of, and I quote, the downtown hooker stroll by city police on at least one occasion and that her last known whereabouts appeared to have been at a downtown Calgary bar during the first week of September. The police, of course, though, stopped short of outright saying that Joyce was working in the sex trade. This situation angered many because once again the police appeared to be sloughing off another young teen murder by hinting at the fact that this must have happened to her because she was working in the sex trade. Finally, this was the point in time where people started to ask questions. Within 21 months, Jennifer Joyce, Jennifer Jans, and Joanne Shaver were all murdered and left in shallow graves under similar situations very close in proximity. Each victim was known to have been living on the streets, and each victim was believed to have perhaps dabbled in one way or another in the sex trade. Perhaps one of the most damning quotes can be found in the October 17th, 1991 edition of the Red Deer Advocate. Augustine Brannigan, a University of Calgary sociology professor, said, and I quote, If there had been four murders of young nurses, the phones at City Hall would be ringing off the hook. These are already fallen women. People think it's their own fault that they have been murdered, unquote. Sadly, this was the common belief at the time, and when you look back and research these cases or any like them, one cannot help but wonder if part of the reason that sex trade and street person were terms that were used was to keep the public at bay and to stop any public outcry or concern. Sadly, the reality always was that the public at large was never in any danger in these situations. It was only people that others viewed as lesser than that were being victimized. Inspector Don McDermott drilled that point home in the same article by saying, and I quote, It's certainly no secret that what you've got is three or four incidents here, at least in the recent past, where you've got young girls that have chosen to live on the street. That's a lot more reckless a life than the average youngster at 17 years of age. This was a police officer taking the opportunity to seemingly pass judgment upon these three women in much the same way. Oh, how we wish that this was the end of the list of missing and murdered women. However, sadly, this was not the case. As the calendar turned to 1992, we had two more cases that were more similar than not. Keely Pincott was a 29-year-old mother of two and a cocktail waitress who by all accounts was a wonderful mother and she loved her children dearly. Keely was working hard and looking forward to a change in careers. She was in love with working with makeup and in love with the modeling profession. In May of 1991, Keeley spoke with her mom for the last time. Six months later, in November of 1991, Keeley would be reported missing by her mom. There would be no word on her whereabouts until March 10th, 1992, when Keeley's skeletal remains would be found in a heavily wooded area two kilometers north of Cochrane, Alberta, off of Highway 1A. She was identified through her dental records, and her cause of death was never reported. However, just like Jennifer Joyce and Jennifer Jans, she was found in a shallow grave, 
just outside of Calgary. There were reportedly no connections to sex trades or living on the streets, but the correlation between proximity to highway, proximity to Calgary, and a shallow grave should not have been overlooked. Also, as mentioned, we did not have cause of death. Calgary had a huge problem, and it was not over yet. Tracy Maunder was 26 years of age in 1992. She was going through a harrowing time in her life. Tracy had her son when she was just 14 years of age. In 1992, she was dealing with the stress of having been diagnosed with cancer and to make ends meet and to try and save enough money to send her sons on flights to stay with their grandmother while she went through her cancer treatment. However, that all changed on October 28, 1992, when Tracy went missing. It only took three days for her remains to be discovered. She was found beaten and stabbed to death off of Garden Road in a grassy field. All of this brings us back to the start of the episode. We started off by talking about Luke Gregoire, a man that many believe was behind many of these deaths, if not all, in this episode. He was known to have been in Quebec when Teresa Allure was murdered, and he was known to have been in Alberta when this series of murders occurred. So you may be asking what his timeline looked like during this unfortunate series of murders. Well, since we cannot say where he was then, we do know that what he would be doing after the fact would also coincide with the seeming end of this string of cases. We do not usually cover too much into the suspects or killers on this show, but because Luke Gregoire could potentially be the missing piece that could put a lot of puzzles together, we will cover him a bit here to end the show. Luke Gregoire, plain and simply, was a predator. A dangerous predator. He was a man that by all intents and purposes struggled to be alone at any time, and he had massive issues between himself and his mother. He believed that she did not love him, and he was a man that was reported to have told his victims while sexually assaulting them that they were not the first, there had been many, and they would not be the last. In February of 1980, not long after the death of Teresa Allure, and before the string of assaults and murders that could possibly be attributed to him in Alberta, Luke would attack Nicole Couture in Quebec as she left a nightclub. He shoved her into his car and repeatedly punched her in the face, as if in a panic, Nicole would say. He would then wrap his hands around her throat and started to strangle her. Nicole decided to try anything that she could to live, and play dead. At that point, he would start to rape her, and Nicole spoke up. Luke would tell her that he had a grudge against women because of the lack of love that his mother had given him. He told her that he was not an attractive man and he could not have normal relationships with women, and as such, it was necessary for him to be violent. Nicole was lucky. She told Luke of her children, and she agreed to cooperate if he would just allow her to live. Two weeks after raping Couture, Luke was arrested in the exact same parkade and sentenced for two years in jail for forcible confinement and indecent assault. Sadly, Two years is obviously not a lot of time, and this would not be the first nor the last time that Luke Gregoire would see the inside of a prison cell. After he got out of jail, it is widely believed, and there is obviously evidence, that he went to Alberta, where he had also been before he was committing his misdeeds in Quebec. On May 13, 1986, he was sentenced to seven years in prison for armed robbery. In May of 1990, an assessment on Gregoire would express major reservations regarding his mandatory release that was coming up quickly because he had not actually shown any willingness or acceptance of the fact that changes needed to be made within his life. In September of 1990, he was told that it would be mandatory for him to undergo counseling upon his release. January 21st of 1991, would see him released from jail, and he also would proceed to refuse to participate in said counseling. In January of 1993, he would be charged with impaired driving, and also, when he killed Lailani Silva, 
He was actually out on bail after an assault charge was levied against him the previous April. Neither one of these charges were ever reported to the people in charge of his parole for the prior convictions in Quebec. Sadly, either one of these issues having been reported would have led to Luke having his parole revoked. What led, at least partly, to this oversight was the fact that on Luke Gregoire's paperwork, there was a typo. The typo stated that he was released from mandatory supervision on parole on May 13th of 1990, even though it was supposed to read 1993. In 1994, Luc Gregoire would be found guilty in the rape and murder of Leilani Silva at the age of 33. The court of the Queen's Bench Justice, Arthur Lutz, called the slaying, quote, one of the most disgusting, barbaric acts he had ever seen. Luke would die in prison in 2015 after only being convicted of one murder. Now, there is obviously not any confirmation or conviction here for Luke in any of these other cases. The story that we're telling you today is to show that timelines line up here. Links can be made, and there are a lot of similarities in these cases of rape and murder that could very easily have been attributed to Luc Gregoire. We are not saying that he was guilty of all or any of these crimes, but rather he wanted to show correlation and also show just how painstaking the process can be for families everywhere that go through the loss of loved ones without receiving answers. Could Luke have committed all of these crimes and possibly even more? Absolutely. There are a lot of things here that point to the fact that Gregoire could very well have been the Alberta serial killer during this time frame, or one of more than one serial killers that were operating in the area at this time. Regardless, this is a story of a man who did awful, horrendous things, and many women whose cases have not been closed to this day. It is absolutely heartbreaking to learn, read, study, and report on these cases because the fact of the matter is that there will never be an end to stories to tell because the sheer number of cases out there of missing or murdered people is massive. Times have changed, but there are still typos in paperwork and oversights every single day within the legal system in Canada and around the world. This is something that can always be tightened up more and something that really does need to change. There is a strong possibility here that many women in this case alone could have had their lives saved and trauma and horror could have been avoided if only Luke's paperwork, crimes, and past were readily visible to everyone and correct. That is truly the heartbreak of this story. That is where we will wrap it up for this week and this story. As always, we do thank you for your time and your listenership of Gone But Never Forgotten. If you want to reach out to chat, let us know how we're doing, or to give us ideas, please do. We can be reached via email at gbnfpod at gmail.com, on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash gbnfpodcast, on Twitter at GBNF Podcast or on Instagram at GBNF Pod. In closing, the last thing I do want to, of course, mention, if you know anything about any of these cases um, and what has happened and had happened to these poor young women, please reach out to Crime Stoppers or to the local police in Calgary. Obviously, no amount of time going by will heal wounds, and closure is always important for those involved. Take care, have an amazing couple of weeks, and continue to check in with us to hear about people who are unfortunately gone, but who will never be forgotten.